Hello and welcome to the Celtic View podcast, the podcast of the nine in a row champions. I'm the editor Paul Cuddy and on this podcast I'm joined by my Celtic View colleagues Joe Donnelly and Tony Conley. We're going to be discussing all things Celtic, a lot to discuss since the last podcast we had. Most recently of course that was that Europa League defeat against AC Milan but before we start going back through that game let's hear from the manager who spoke to Celtic TV after the game. Neil, how would you sum up the 90 minutes this evening? No, I'm disappointed we've lost. You know, it's another defeat at home, which you know it's hard to take. I thought we were good value for at least a draw. You know, particularly on the second half showing, and um, yeah, we were a lot better, you know, tonight than we were at the weekend. Better body language, better energy, better quality. I thought we started the game brightly and then conceded a really soft goal, and that sort of rocked us a little bit. Um, and then to go 2 0 down was really hard to take at half time. But the reaction from the players, second half was, was superb, and I thought we deserved something out of the game. In that second half, um, was the biggest influence the change in formation or personnel, or, or did both play their part? I think both played their part. You know, we, we, we couldn't start Ryan tonight. You know, he's been out for two weeks, and, um, you know, we've been wanting to maybe look at, you know, getting the wingers back into the game. But James, he's still like long term, and, and Mike, he's just coming back from a long term injury, so we're a little bit sort of um, hamstrung in that. We started brightly. I thought the two strikers worked quite well, but you know Griff tired, and we decided to change things up a little bit and getting Ryan on and getting Moy on, and they looked far more comfortable. And Roger coming on was a real bonus for us as well. I thought he played very well, and I, I thought the impetus was with us. We just lacked that bit of quality in the final third of times where we've worked in. A, the ball into really good positions and our final ball when we've got beyond them was just lacking a little bit tonight and that we have to get better at that at this level It would have been easy for them to feel sorry for themselves at two down in the second half um, but perhaps more surprisingly they looked like the team on the front foot going into that last 10-15 minutes and the side that we're going to score if anyone Yeah I mean I've, I never felt uncomfortable in the game you know and um, you know, the, the, the manner of both the goals first half is disappointing and something, you know, that we'll look at. But um, I thought the reaction second half and the will to win was, was all for there to see. And I think it's been, um, well, it's a defeat. We've got to take something from it and, you know, improve on that as we go along now, which we will. Thanks, Neil. Cheers, John. Joe, you and I were at Celtic Park on Thursday night for the game against Milan. We always knew it was going to be a difficult game and, and it turned out to be the case. The manager, obviously, you know, the positives were the second half performance. We get back into the game before we were hit by that sucker punch at the end. But, you know, there was no doubt it was a, it was a tough game against top quality opposition. Yeah, Milan are, are so good, um, especially with those two goals in the first half. I kind of think that they were quite content to just contain Celtic for most of the second. But like the manager said, um, Particularly the last 25 for me, I thought we looked really, really good um, after getting that goal back with Moyo Unice. We really did look like the team that was going to score. Naturally, playing so far within the front foot, left us a wee bit exposed at the back. Um, and with a team of, of Milan's class and prowess, they're not going to make any, any mistakes there. But I think that given that the manager, when he said this in his, his press with Celtic TV, that you know Saturday was disappointing in the derby, so in terms of a reaction, whilst the scoreline wasn't, you know, what we're looking for, it's obviously disappointing to get beat at home on any occasion, no matter who the opposition is. The reaction certainly in the second half, or if a long spells of the game, it certainly made, you know, some amends for for the disappointment of the weekend before. And I know we've we've spoken about this before, and often the players and the manager do as well. And it, well, I think for us, we're all aware of of the kind of privileged position we're in that we're still able to go to the games. But even last night when we came out onto the main stand, I was doing the Celtic TV commentary with Dan D. The two of us both, almost at the same time, said that was the strangest experience ever because you know, you're know you 20 minutes away from a big European game against one of Europe's top sides and you walk out into the stand and it's absolutely quiet. Yeah, I mean, we're so used to that, that really raucous atmosphere at Celtic Park on those big European nights. Uh, even just looking at the fixtures, obviously with the derby last week, we had Milan on Thursday night. Um, Tondre and Sunday, a uh, European trip away, and then the cup semi-final after that. These are big, big games that fans like us you know, would normally be um, really excited for. We're still excited for them, but it's so, so different. Um, you never walk alone at the start of the game. 
as well. You know, that's definite in any other occasion. And yeah, it was it was even strange in, in the office beforehand. We were sitting there at quarter past seven, 45 minutes away from the game, as you were saying. You normally hear the fans just roaring outside and all the kind of fanfare which comes with it. Um, which is definitely missing, certainly from, from a fan's perspective and certainly from the player's perspective. Unfortunately, they still need to go out and, and do the business. Um, but yeah, really, really surreal experience, to say the least. And Tony, I suppose, you know, the three of us were working on the, the nine in a row book, the kind of official story of, of nine in a row, which is coming out shortly. And over the course of the season, what we've done is we've picked just nine highlights from each season. But what, what interested me at the time was when you look back at those seasons, you forget that there are peaks and troughs, there's some moments of adversity which the team come through and I suppose just now, you know, it's two defeats on the bounce, which doesn't happen very often for Celtic so it's it's a time for you know the players, I'm sure, will obviously be desperate to get back to winning ways, but, but those are the challenges in the course of the season which ultimately, when, when we're successful, we end up forgetting. Yeah, I know, we always look at it through rose-tinted glasses don't we, especially with a club like Celtic and, and, and the history we have we think back to to the you know the Martin New Years and and even before that there's so many great games so many great memories but yeah there are the defeats that, that that came with those great seasons as well but I think the positive is is the performance in this game was was really good and you know there's a lot of positives to take from it as well you had the Yeti getting more minutes in his his legs coming back you had Griffiths there. So there was, there was plenty to take from it and I think that would bear fruit in the upcoming games, which are all really important as well. So yeah, two defeats, but I, I think the, the game's coming forward as well. I think we can take a lot from those two defeats and, and put it to good use and, and get some positives from them. And it's funny, you know, obviously the, the defeats present themselves to challenge as well, but I always think, you know, we're, we're missing a number of key players, Forrest and Julian are out injured, but then we obviously had Watson Edward, Mir Breton and Hattie Melhamid had all tested positive for COVID. So first of all, we just, we just obviously keep our fingers crossed that they recover and, and they can get back to fitness. We also had the slightly strange situation with Ryan Christie. It was good to see him back playing last night, but I, I think for him, even when he spoke after the game, you could, you could still hear the frustration because obviously He'd never tested positive. He'd subsequently two or three negative tests with Celtic, but yet... Six, six negative tests that he'd returned. I didn't realise it was that many until I heard this post-match. Six negative tests, so you can see where that frustration is coming from. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, that, that, that thing, Tony, I always think if, you know, when a team loses so many key players, even though we've got a good squad, it, it's, these things are difficult for any team to, to, to deal with. Yeah, it's a huge disruption as well, and... It must be strange for the players and, and really frustrating. I imagine it's it's probably like in school when the teacher gives you any trouble for something that you you didn't do. You're you're, you're sitting there and you're like, I'm, I didn't. So Ryan Christie's you know fully fit. He's not even suspended. But I mean that's the way it is. Obviously that it can't be any other way. It has to you know follow the precautions and we're we're doing everything right and that's great. But as a player when you're you're on form and you're fit and there's there's big games you're going to be absolutely gutted as well. And and that's going to disrupt your flow as well but when you've got so many players that, that are out of the team as well we need to take that into account there's going to be as we said these peaks and troughs throughout the season and and the fact we've had a couple of losses now that have come during a time when so many players aren't available it's it's not a coincidence you know when, when these players come back we're going to be up to full strength and the performances are going to come with that and they're going to gradually improve. And Joe Tony you know, mentioned the fact that we are positives from the game against Milan, obviously Ryan Christie coming back in, he set up the goal with the corner. You could see his, you know, the, the power from his set pieces. I also thought Diego Laxa, that was his only second game, obviously against his parent club and keen to make an impression. And I thought down that left hand side, but he did very well. Yeah, he was really good. Um, it's kind of funny how it works as well. Like when we had uh, Odson Edward and Lee Griffiths, you know, firing all cylinders towards the end of last season, that 3 5 2 formation was really suiting Celtic. Manager changed it at half time. I guess Milan it back to a back four. And by having El Yunusi and Christie in those kind of wide areas, we widened the pitch, even though um, we're playing with, with that four at the back. But it also allowed El Yunusi just to step in and allow Diego lax out that space. Um, and he looks like, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's only his second game. He's played in a derby where the pace of the game's a little bit quicker. He's played against his parent club and they, you know what they're about. But, I mean, they're such a good side. It's like a difficult side to play against. So he's really shown some some signs in those two games. Um, you had to play a full 90 minutes as well. And I think, yeah, you can take you can take a lot of confidence moving forward. 
Um, and Ryan Christie as well. I mean, he just, in that second half especially, that, that, that spark perhaps, that bit of pace, that bit of energy at that end of the pitch missing. And, you know, if somebody like Diego lacks that, it's got a point to prove against his parent club, as you say, with Ryan Christie being out. You're absolutely right, Tony. We do need to follow the precautions. There does feel like there's a little bit of unfairness there, given that, you know, he didn't test positive of an interested negative so many times. I understand that that's the way it has to be. It um, doesn't make it any less frustrating, especially when you see that energy that Ryan brings to the team. And he'll be keen to hit the ground running now as well. And also Kieran Tierney, who had been told to self-isolate play for Arsenal against Manchester City last weekend, which I think, you know, Neil Lennon said at the time, ahead of the, the Derby game, their fans would be looking for an explanation. Obviously, different rules apply in Scotland than England, but it, it did seem there was a, an element of, well, certainly people were a bit bemused. Yeah, and I, I can only imagine that's that's we still speak to to Ryan Christie since um, on the on the view side of things. But I can only imagine that adds to his frustration. I know that Ryan was working hard. I know that the manager had said that they'd sent a treadmill. He said but it's not the same thing. I saw him on Instagram um, when he was back at training through the week before the Milan game. Really g'd up and looking to get back in, looking forward to being back amongst his, his uh, teammates and stuff. But yeah, the, the whole Kieran Tierney thing makes it harder to accept as a fan as well, doesn't it? Um, and yeah, I think that um, Tony kind of touched upon this about the players taking positives from these games. Ryan Christie's one of those players. Callum McGregor, I know he said after the Derby game that they really need to, to use that defeat and push on. And we've been in this position before. I know it's easy for us to say... Um, to try and put a positive spin in things, but Cal McGregor has said that before, and we have been, you know, we have taken a step back, especially in derby games, and really come strong after that. So, you know, if, if history has taught us anything, these players know how to do that, and I'm confident they will. Celtic found, FC Foundation set up the Football for Good Fund right at the very beginning of the pandemic. They announced last week that it's now the, the total, uh, thanks to the support of, of of fans from all over the world is, is over £900,000. Now, I think it's an extraordinary figure. It's extraordinary work. It's a bugbear of mine that, uh, you know, I turn on the TV and other clubs have maybe raised uh, a fraction of that for the local community, which is still commendable. And they're getting national uh, highlights. But Celtic, with, with the amount of money that's been spent in the local community, but also further afield, elsewhere in the UK and even over in, in the United States, they don't get the credit, but I, you know, I think what the people in the Celtic FC Foundation do is extraordinary. And, and Tony, whenever you know Tony Hamilton, chief executive, he was on this podcast, but he's always at pains to emphasise, you know, they're doing that work. But it's the supporters, it's the ordinary fans, who are just backing it with their generosity. Yeah, I know it's it's a real crowd point for any Celtic fan, and I think. People on the outside maybe take it for granted because it's just it's just constant. It's just it's never ending. The, the the foundation's always always busy with something, and the fans are always supporting it as well. So, uh, you know uh, that's newsworthy, but maybe it's just it's overlooked because it, it's happening all the time. But it can be underestimated the kind of contributions and all the, the the work and time and effort that gets put into it. And it does. It's another reason to be to be really proud of, of your club that, that's doing something like that because there aren't any others that are as dedicated and focused to doing that as Celtic. I mean, I don't know whether it's just because I'm older than you guys and a bit slightly more cynical. I kind of feel that, that, that sometimes national media are reluctant to, to praise us too much because they always have this idea that they have to balance it up. But uh, anyway, that's, that's for another story. It's interesting, I think, right at the beginning of the pandemic, again, football, you know, particularly down in England, a lot of the, the top Premier League players, uh, they seem to be scapegoated as if somehow... They were they were the, the focus of they have to step up to the plate and do stuff rather than you know the, the government. Marcus Rashford obviously just went about his business. Uh, you know has helped raise I think over a million pounds to be feeding uh, kids at school. You know you know people who you know children uh, who who need that that meal every day. Again, it's it's for a for a footballer who is a top class footballer scored the winning goal against Paris Saint Germain in midweek. But it's still campaigning, uh, even against kind of inexplicable opposition to to give children who need most the, the, what should be a basic right, which is, is a meal every day. It's incredible, isn't it? Like you, you said it, Paul, at the, the start of this, um, footballers were targeted in terms of, you know, obviously most footballers at professional level earn quite a lot of money and they should be getting into their pockets of the fair wages and stuff like that. And a lot of players stepped up in that regard and at Celtic as well. Marcus Rashford is incredible, especially with um, 
with his age, um, with his high profile status, um, given an MB, an MB by the government, wasn't it? Um, which kind of, to me, um, without getting too political on it, it's kind of like if the government were just doing their job, then these what I view as token um, awards wouldn't be um, completely necessary. But Marcus Rashford just kept on pushing and kept going. And I think he's a credit to um, his club, to his country and to his community that, and that he's, he's trying so hard to represent. I mean, you mentioned how difficult this pandemic has been for everyone in the world, for football fans, for everybody. Um, and he has been, he's been a real shining beacon at a time when, yeah, I mean, quite a lot of people in high level positions have let the country down, in my opinion. And interesting, one of the, the best interviews I saw in recent weeks was actually from Andy Robertson, obviously Scotland internationalist, but like back at Liverpool, who was talking to, about Marcus Rashford, praising him and saying, it's probably the first time that you, you'll actually, you know, if fans get back in for a, a Liverpool-Manchester United game, that, that a, a Manchester United player might get a stand innovation <laughs> at Anfield from Liverpool fans. And that tells you everything that, that you need to know about what he's done. And, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm full of admiration for him. It's worth uh, reminding people as well, if you go into the Celtic website, Celtic FC Foundation are doing a, a football auction, again, just to raise money for the football for a good fund. There's a whole range of brilliant memorabilia, you know, lots of top players. The managers donated a couple of signed shirts, but you've you know, got a whole raft of, of former players, great players from Celtic who have donated some memorabilia that, that you can bid for an auction. And of course, all the money's going to help Celtic FC Foundation, so you can check that out. Tony, you and I are on our travels this weekend. We're heading to Petaudry, we're back on league duty. And I know we often, you know, any time we've, we've done interviews, in the view and particularly after the beat it's important to get back to winning ways but you know having touched on the fact that we, we have lost the last two games it's probably never been more important that we got there produce the sort of performances that we've seen in the past at Petaudry and come back down the road with all three points. Yeah it's, it's a really big game um, and it's not going to be easy it never is but Celtic have got a good record at Petaudry as well Aberdeen on good form with three wins and a draw in the last four games. And I, I was watching the highlights of their 4 2 win against Hamilton there. And all four of their goals, it was a bit of variety, you know, working something in the box, shooting from distance, from a set piece, from a header. So they're going to be dangerous from all angles. But Celtic will come into this knowing what to expect. They always have a tough game up at Aberdeen, but they always raise their game there as well. And they'll want to come here and get three points and, and get this run of important fixtures off to a good start, especially against Aberdeen, facing them in the, the semi-final the following week. It's a chance to kind of identify their strengths and weaknesses and maybe land a psychological blow as well ahead of that game at, at Hamden the following week. Because that is, I mean, it's, it's good that you mentioned that because I, I still I find it hard to get my head around the fact that we're playing last season. So it's, it's kind of back to the future because we are playing last season, semi-final this season. And if we get past Aberdeen, the cup final is five days before Christmas, so it, it's quite a strange, it mean, be a strange experience for, for everyone, the fact that we're at Hamden, but it's, we have to tell ourselves it's the Scottish Cup and not the League Cup. I know, I know. Um, it's just more chance for, for silverware as well, you know, chance to win four pieces of silverware in the, the same season as well, so it is, it's, it's strange, it's, it's surreal and it's going to be as well inside Hamden, no fans, a Scottish Cup semi-final, big game, and it's it's going to be completely empty as well. But it's good to have those big games this side of the year as well. We know what December's like as well with the League Cup final and November and December with the League Cup final. So having these big games, it's exactly what the, the players want as well. And it's good as fans to, to have more to look forward to when we're watching from home. Is that, you know, the we're talking about the, the two games against Aberdeen, but it's a real tough run of fixtures until the next international break. Obviously, we've had the derby, we've had AC Milan, Petaudry this weekend, France next Thursday, the semi-final, Prague at home, and then I think it's Fir Park. So that is that is a, a tough run of, of fixtures for the side. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I I think, sorry, George. It wouldn't be a side to be exactly. a point. Yeah, let's talk another one another. Please, on you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, I'm, I'm trying to think back to a, a run of fixtures like that, as difficult as it is. But, you know, the, the coming off the back of that AC Milan game, there are positives from that. And as I said earlier, I think, you know, those positives will bear fruit in, in these games. We've got players getting minutes in their legs. Hopefully, odds on will be back soon. That's Ryan Christie back. There'll be a number of players 
now coming back, um, which is what you need coming into these really difficult fixtures. And it, obviously, Joe will let, will, let, will let you talk now as well. But oh, no, the, other no, thing, no, no. the other thing about the uh, you know over the next month is we don't have another home league game. I think until the start of December, we, you know we've obviously got the, the Sparta Prague game at Celtic Park, but you know just the way the fixtures have fallen. Obviously, there's an international break right in the middle of November, but it, it's quite a big gap between the last league game at Celtic Park and then the next one. It's so strange because normally that would be um, something which as a fan, really concerns you. But given the situation just now we closed off football, I wonder how much that impacts things. Um, no, what I was going to say before is, is just as a, as a supporter looking ahead to these fixtures, it's really exciting. There's obviously that little bit of trepidation because they're big games and obviously off the back of two defeats, you are hurting somewhat. Um, I know that the players have to have this standpoint, but one of the things which is encouraging from our privileged position where we get to speak to them is they're all for it. They look to these fixtures and that's what they want. You know, they want these high-profile fixtures. Speaking to Stephen Welsh for, for next week's Celtic View, um, and he was uh, just before the, the the Milan game, and he was saying, you know, how disappointed he was after the derby. He coming through the ranks at Celtic, he's a big Celtic fan. He said the players are, you know, the disappointment starts with the players. Let's um, be under no illusions that you know they're not bothered by any of this. They're feeling it really, really um, badly at the moment. Obviously, Milan didn't go as well as planned, but he's looking forward to. Um, these big games. The Rangers game was, of course, only his second game, having played against Hamilton last year. And Milan um, is his third, uh, which is, you know, that's some run. And he's looking forward to, to these games, to his development, but also to, to really, you know, get Celtic going, as are all the players as well. So, yeah, um, no, no home fixtures for a while, which, you know, isn't, it's not ideal. But at the same time, it's weird because, you know, that home advantage is really diluted at the minute, given that we don't have fans in. Obviously, you mentioned that Stephen Welsh will be in next week's Celtic View. Uh, also, in next week's Celtic View, we'll look forward to the Lille game. We'll do a preview on them. We'll also look back at five, we'll pick five semi-final clashes against Aberdeen down through the years. Just happened that we've won all five of them, so we'll just to look forward to the Hamden game. Uh, Joe, you also caught up with Lisa Robertson, one of the, the players for the Celtic FC women's team. They kicked off their season last weekend a 2-0 defeat against uh, Glasgow City. They don't have a game this weekend the following week, but they're up against Hearts. So they're back up and running. Obviously, their season stopped before it really even started. Yeah, it's a really strange one for the women's side as well because they had that uh, really momentous victory against Glasgow City back in March. And then as the first fixture of the, of the new campaign, their season runs um, in the middle of the year as opposed to throughout the winter, as the, the men's game does. They win that game and then things get... Um, cancelled and restarted much further down the line they play the same fixture list and then of course they, they suffer a defeat um, but I think similar to the men's side they were saying that there were positives to be drawn by that result and whilst they felt a little hard done by with that you know getting that good result and then being forced to to set aside throughout the, the pandemic it's the same for everybody so they're keen to you know put that defeat behind them now and focus on, on moving forward and yeah she seems just like everybody in world football, no matter, no matter what level you're playing at, they seem really keen just to get fixtures under their belt now and keep going. And Tony, I mentioned that you'll be heading up to Pataudry. Apart from the fact that, that we both know it's going to be absolutely freezing up there, what are you anticipating for Sunday's game? I'm anticipating a, a good win for, for Celtic. Um, they'll, they'll be really up for it as well. They'll want to get points back on the board in, in, in the league. They've got a positive association with going up to Petodre with the, with the results they've got there and everybody's got something to, to prove, you know, wanting to stake a claim for a, a place in the squad with all these players coming back, you know, you have Mikey Johnson back in training, um, you know, and I think that'll help push El Unice on as well for a bit of competition there and you've got James Forrest coming back soon as well and Stephen Welsh will want to stay in the team, um, you know, with, with the other defenders coming back as well, so I think it'll, Celtic will hit the ground running. They'll start strongly. They'll they'll they'll, they'll take a lot from the performance against a really good AC Milan team, and they'll want to make a statement. You know, knowing that they're facing Aberdeen the following week and, and want to get a convincing win in the league, given the the last result in the league. So we're waiting with bated breath for your score prediction. Uh, my score prediction, of which I've got none right this uh, season so far, I'm going to say. 2-1 Celtic, go in the last 10 minutes to win it. There you go. Tony, what about you? I'm going to say 2-0.
I've decided. I've decided this season all my predictions will be two one. Shane Duffy one and go. And at one point it will come true. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm happy with that either way. I'll take any any one of the three. Uh, so I think as long as we come back down the road with the three points, uh, that's all that matters. Thanks, guys, for joining me on the podcast. We're going to leave you with uh, a game from last season. It was the Sunday after a, a Europa League tie against Italian opposition. Celtic headed to Petodre, and by half time they were already leading by four goals to nil. Frimpong, of course. Uh... Dutch under 19 international. Forward comes Edward. Lots of red jerseys, but still Edward. Great chance and a great goal from Odson Edward. Ten minutes have gone here at Petodre and Odson Edward. A solo effort. He took on three Aberdeen defenders and he sold them all a dummy. He took the ball back onto his right foot and slotted that one past Joe Lewis. What a start for Celtic. Edward looks pleased with that one, and so he should be. That was that was fantastic, really good awareness. He started that with a nice one-two with Forrest, just drives through, shrugs off a challenge, gets beyond a player, just makes a little bit of space, and then his right foot just slots that one past the keeper into the, the bottom corner. But a typical, brilliant, close control from Edward there, and he just works space out of nothing, and it's a, a wonderful finish. as 11th of the season now. He had so much to do because there were so many red jerseys around him, but that little touch just there where he just changes direction that opened the space out ahead of him and of course the one thing we know about French Eddie when he gets half a sight of goal he knows how to put it away what a great start for Celtic then so if you've just joined us 1-0 to Celtic the goal after 10 minutes scored by Odds on Edward. Here's Frimpong, a chance to show his pace. Does well into the box, gives it to Edward, takes it to the byline, back to Frimpong, and he's done it! The youngster gets his first goal for Celtic. He started the move, he finished the move, and it's 2 0 inside 15 minutes. A wonderful run forward there from Frimpong, as you were saying earlier, Jerry. That's exactly what he likes to do, and he's shown him strength there as well. He's, he's under a little bit of pressure, feeds it out to Edward. It's a, a good ball back from Edward as well and then a bit of a scrappy finish but Fringpong gets himself in there and manages to, to muscle his way in between the two defenders, gets the touch on it and then he's there to just knock that one in brilliant from the youngster and you can see he's absolutely delighted with that, his third professional appearance in senior football and that's him, got a goal and his first goal in senior football I think he did get that touch just before the ball nipped under the goalkeeper we'll perhaps see it better from, from this angle showed a bit of strength found Edward yeah, got the touch there, just under the goalkeeper's body. What a start from Celtic. What a start to Frimpong's career as a Celtic player. There's the touch there, just before it went past the goalkeeper. It's Frimpong's goal, and it's 2-0 to Celtic. But once again, Celtic win it back. Great little turn from Frimpong. Turned in a sixpence there, did the youngster? Here he is, still with the ball at his feet, finds McGregor. Now Rogic. Back to Brown. Rogic to Forrest. Rogic back again to his great friend James Forrest. Edward now back to Scott Brown. Lovely build up play from Celtic. On the left hand side is Ball and Golly. He's forced back by McLennan. Celtic still have it though. Ball and Golly cutting inside from the left hand side, using his strength to keep possession. Rogic now, can that space open up? A great chance for El Yanusi. In comes James Forrest. What a third goal from Celtic. It was finished by Forrest, but it was created by so many of his teammates. It's 3 0 to Celtic, and you could say that that is the pick of the bunch. That was wonderful build up play from Celtic. Really good passing ball and goal. Just coming in from the left there, holding off a challenge. And it's a great ball from Roderick through to El Yunusi, who turns Forrester's run in. He just tees it up for him, and then he just has to, to walk it up to the keeper and just slot it past them. Wonderful play from Celtic, and a really good run there from James Forrest. Good awareness from El Yunusi as well. This is fantastic stuff from Celtic at Petodre. What an absolute joy to watch when Celtic are in full flow. 
They really are great to watch. And Ball and Golly had such a good hand in that goal. But Rogic and Forrest combining, and Elian Nussi getting in, and then Forrest just coming in, taking the ball and saying, I've got it, lads. There you go. Great ball forward by Scott Brown to find Frimpong on the right-hand side. Great close control from the youngsters onto his left foot, back onto his right. It breaks back to him and comes across from Rogic. What a chance for a fourth! And it is a fourth! And it's El Yanusi. One minute to half-time. And if they weren't already, that surely is the three points wrapped up at Pataudry. What a first 45 minute for Celtic. Aberdeen nil, Celtic four. And some of the Aberdeen fans are leaving. They're not going to get a pie, they're off. That was a, a great cross in there from Rodrik, just in a, an in-swinging cross with his left foot. Picks out El Yanusi, who his finish is just absolutely perfect. He, great control with his chest, holds off the defender, and then he's just fired that one across goal into the top corner. Brilliant finish and absolutely fantastic from Celtic this first half. Unbelievable, 4-0 before half-time. If anyone thought Celtic were going to relinquish their Premiership title this season, think again. Sixty-three minutes gone here at Pataudry. Aberdeen nil, Celtic four. All four goals coming in the first forty-five minutes. Edward Frimpong, Forrest, and El Yanusi all on target for the boys. Is there more to come in the last half hour or so of this game? Here's Edward brought down on the edge of the box, and again the frustration showing in these Aberdeen players. And again, it's odds on Edward that's the target. And again, I fancy he'll want to have a go from this angle. Forward comes Edward, tries to keep it down and does, and I think Lewis got a touch on that one. That one was heading in. And Celtic have the corner. A bit of a loose pass there from uh, Beaton, but Scott Brown well possession to win possession back. Now Celtic have men forward as James Forrest comes bursting into the, the final third. A great chance for Frimpong, perhaps for a, a second goal. He went for goal, or perhaps he should have passed, but you can totally understand why he did. He had the space, but the angle was just a little bit too narrow for the youngster. And Celtic will solidify their place at the top of the league table. Three points ahead of Rangers with a four goals better in the goal difference tally and there we have it, the final whistle goes, the boos ring out at Pataudry the home fans came here hoping to see another victory and a victory against the champions that might spark something into their season but it was not to be because Celtic are on form, Celtic are flying and after 44 minutes here in Pataudry the game was well and truly over